generations to come. And welcome to another edition of the TDN Writers Room podcast, the Post Preakness edition. My name is Bill Finley. I'm a correspondent for the Thoroughbred Daily News. I also do a radio show on Sirius XM Radio every Saturday with Dave Johnson called Down the Stretch, 10 to 1 Eastern Time. Please tune us in. And I'm Randy Moss with NBC Sports with uh, lively Lucy back there in the background now, back home, back in the home studio and uh, ready to roll, Bill. Well, of course, uh, let's get back to the Preakness, which was the big story last week. And look, on paper, it didn't look like it was going to be a particularly sizzling, sensational race, and it wasn't. Um, to be fair, um, you know, the winner is a good horse in National Treasure. Mage ran well to finish third, blazing sevens for Chad Brown. He almost pulled it off again, would have been the third time he passed the Derby with a horse and came in and won uh, the Preakness. Very good stretch duel. But Randy, I, th- I think the real story of the race was the pace. And, you know, we saw in the Derby how important it was because it was so fast. In the Preakness, we saw how important it was because it was so slow. Big advantage for National Treasure and John Velasquez, who we'll hear from shortly. He's the Green Group guest of the week, took advantage of it. And a horse who, you know, at the beginning of the year might have been no better than Bob Baffert's fifth or sixth best three-year-old in his barn. It's now the Preakness winner. Yeah, I mean, the pace, obviously, by far, the, the big story here. And it's not, a, it's not a stretch to say it was a historically slow pace. Because if you go back through the Preaknesses looking for anything that could be as slow as 48.92, for the half mile. You go back to 1973 with Secretariat in his Preakness, but then there was a timing malfunction. And it looked on paper like the fractions for that race were way slower than you would expect. So that was probably a malfunction. You got to go back to 1960 before that, or what's called Ballyache went wire to wire in the Preakness, but that was before hundreds of a second were used in timing. He went 48 and four fifths and then before that, even uh, citation in 1948 went 50 and change for a half mile in a four horse field in which they completely left him alone. So it, very, very rare to see a pace this slow in the Preakness, but you could really see it coming. There were only two horses in the race on paper that had any kind of early speed at all. National Treasure and the Maryland Horse Coffee with Chris. And when we went to talk to John Salzman Jr., the trainer of uh, Coffee with Chris, a couple of days before the race, you know, I asked him, I said, so you're the only other horse with speed. You know, how do you play that? Do you try to put pressure on National Treasure to keep it from getting away too, too easily? And Salzman said, no. He said, what we'd like to do is sit off of National Treasure and go as slow as we both possibly can and turn it into a match race at the quarter pole. And then from the quarter pole home, may the best horse win. He think he said, I think that's the best chance that we have of winning or of hitting the board because he was one of the long shots in there. So knowing that, knowing that no one, not even Coffee with Chris, was going to be putting pressure on National Treasure directly during the first part of the race, you could really see it coming that this was going to be, uh, that the pace was going to be a huge story. And when Red Route won, of all horses, was fairly close to the pace going down the backstretch. I mean, that was just even more of an illustration of exactly how slow they were going. I was honestly surprised that given the pace, that National Treasure didn't kick away and draw off and win by four or five lengths down the lane. I think that might be telling going forward. Uh, because if National Treasure runs in the Belmont Stakes, uh, given the setup that he had in the Preakness and the fact that he still had to fight tooth and nail to be Blazing Sevens, uh, I would think National Treasure would be a play against uh, next time out. Yeah, we'll talk uh, about the prospective field for the Belmont a little bit later. A 98 buyer number for the Preakness. That's not going to get anybody too excited. Um, the 105 for Mage in the Kentucky Derby. So from that uh, aspect, the group regressed. Um, I thought Mage at with these crazy odds at seven to five. Who on earth was ever going to make Chase the Chaos ten to one and Coffee with Chris ten to one? Two of the craziest prices we've ever seen in any. Uh, triple crown race ever. But nonetheless, I thought at seven to five, Mage was a good win bet because I thought he should have been three to five or four to five in there. 
he ran fine. Um, you know, the pace didn't uh, help him. But again, he wasn't so far back that if he really put in an A-plus effort, he couldn't have got the job done. Castellano rode a good race. He kept him close. He was third, uh, uh, three and a half lengths behind a half mile out. But, uh, you know, not being able to close against horses that were roughed up by the early pace, um, you know, he ran sort of evenly in there. Um, I guess I don't think much differently about him now than I did after the Derby. He's a very good horse. He ran a good race. We won't see him in the Belmont. Um, is he a superstar? No, he's probably not even the best three-year-old out there, but they got that Kentucky Derby. They didn't embarrass themselves in the Preakness. And as always, it's a shame that he won't be going to Belmont Park with a chance to uh, put 100,000 people in the stands screaming and yelling for another triple crown winner. Yeah. I mean, you and I don't differ very often, but we have a difference of opinion about the seven to five on Mage. I thought that he was actually overbet at seven to five because he had a fast pace set up in the Florida Derby, even though he didn't break. He had an extremely fast pace set up in the Kentucky Derby. And now, and granted, knowing what we knew about National Treasure vis-a-vis Coffee with Chris, Amage was suddenly going to be in a completely different situation. He also was going to be coming back on two weeks rest where every other horse in the field, including National Treasure, had more of a rest period leading into the Breakness. So, you know, there are different ways of looking at it. I thought Blazing Sevens actually ran an exceptional race. He was three to three and a half wide around the first turn, a couple of paths outside of National Treasure. He was at least one path outside of National Treasure around the second turn. So he probably ran three to three and a half lengths farther in the race than National Treasure did. And yet it still looked like he was maybe likely to win at the eighth pole. Uh, when they were battling down the stretch. So a really good effort for him. And I agree with you. I thought Mage, given the circumstances, actually turned in a pretty creditable race. I don't think he lost much in defeat. And it'll be interesting to see how these horses stack up a little further down the road. Knock on wood, they they come back healthy. The other horses perform. I mean, he didn't have any more of an excuse than Blazing Sevens or Mage had, really. Uh, He just didn't have it. I think Suge McGahee said it right. It wasn't the pace really for him. He just didn't show up, uh, which was disappointing given the way he looked in the Tezio, although the number in that race was very slow. That turned out to be pretty telling. And as far as everybody else, I mean, I thought that, uh, you know, there weren't really, other than pace, any real tangible excuses. Randy, I, we don't disagree as much as you might think about Mage. I, I, I agree with everything you just said about him, but what I looked at, and maybe, you know, you take, took a little different look, was that he stood out on paper as clearly the best horse in the race based on what he did in the Kentucky Derby and based on the quality of the field for the Preakness. The uh, 17 horses he faced in the Kentucky Derby are miles and light years yeah. ahead as a group versus the um, six horses he faced in the Preakness. I, I understood it was going to be likely a more difficult trip, but I mean, I thought he was kind of a man among boys and um, he was good as we both agreed, but, but, but not good enough. So, um, but you know, we'll see what he does. I, you know, it's one of those years, the three-year-old championship is not going to be decided until the fall, maybe not even until the Breeders' Cup Classic. I bet I'll tell you right now, a three-year-old is going to win the Breeders' Cup Classic because the older horse group stinks, absolutely stinks. So the, uh, you can um, play that back in November and I'll either look like a, a fool or, or, or uh, quite wise. But uh, that, that was my take on that. So yeah. there's a lot to talk about uh, the Baffert story. And we're going to get into the ugliness of the having a meltdown situation. But um, it's worth mentioning the uh, Black Eyed Susans as well. Um, his weekend got off to a, a poor start. Uh, FISA, who skipped the Kentucky Oaks because the owner, Michael Lund Peterson, uh, did not want to run at Churchill Downs because they had a Van Baffert, uh, was looking to keep her career uh, perfect uh, at six for six. And she just was real flat. She was a dull third at three to five and was beaten by Tax. A nice story there claimed by trainer Randy, trainer Randy Morse for $50,000. And old Hoosier Philly, after those really bad races, uh, she improved quite a bit. She ran second. But uh, that was the beginning of Baffert's week and uh, what was a, an incredible roller coaster for the Hall of Fame trainer. Yeah, when you look at the Black Eyed Susan, first of all, uh, 
Faiza, even though she was a solid favorite and she was arguably the best three-year-old filly in the country on paper, still had some questions to answer just because in Baffert's words, she was beating the same fillies over and over in California. And how would they stack up against the best of the East? And the only real clue that we had was the filly and tell me no lies from the Peter Miller barn who had come East uh, for the Breeders' Cup at Keeneland and had come East again for the Kentucky Oaks and had run poorly against the best three-year-old fillies of the East on both occasions which on paper didn't exactly make FaZa, uh, it didn't flatter FaZa. And it turns out that that was probably a pretty good barometer because I didn't think FaZa had any real excuse other than a three-wide trip. And that obviously didn't you know, factor into how badly she performed very much. Uh, taxed a great story. Morse did a really good job, I thought, with his decision to take the blinkers off of Taxed. A couple of races back in the Honey Bee, she had a, a 12 post position at a 12 horse field, which on a sloppy track also. But at Oakland Park, at a mile and a 16th, that post position is a real killer. And they had to use her a little bit early to get position around the first turn. And she just backed up. And he decided, OK, we need to take some of the speed out of her and took the blinkers off. And she responded in the fantasy stakes with a much improved second place finish behind wet paint, having to wait in traffic a little bit, swing out, follow wet paint, was actually keeping up with wet paint the last eighth of a mile once she got clear, which obviously at 11 to one in the uh, Black Eyed Susan, uh, that race in the fantasy was a uh, was a pretty good indication of, uh, of, of what was to come. Great story for Richard Beatty, the owner from Omaha, small time guy, you know, like most owners, he's lost money in the business. He's in it for the moments like this. Biggest win in his career, standing on, you know, the cupola, Black Eyed Susan Winter Circle. And, uh, you know, it's got to be a fantastic moment for him. And the up and down thing for Baffert, it's just crazy, the sport, isn't it? I mean, it's so sad what happened with having to melt down. And it just cast a pall uh, over Baffert's Preakness win, he admits, and uh, over the whole afternoon, fortunately. Uh, we saw some great performances later in the card, but it's not something, uh, the visual is not something that, that goes right. away easily, that's for sure. Randy, th save your thoughts on that because uh, we want to get back into that subject uh, a little bit later. Hey, we had so much fun last week with Peb, Pierre Bullock and his son Remy doing those cartoons. That was really, you know, we've had some great Green Group guests of the week over the several years we've been doing this. I thought this was one of the most fun we've ever had. And they had this contest to see who could do the best cartoon. The theme was the 50th anniversary of Secretariat's Belmont win. And then we had readers of the TDN and listeners and viewers of the podcast vote. I thought they were both terrific cartoons, but Remy beat the old guy, beat, the, beat his father. So Remy's cartoon was liked by the most people. And then among the people that picked Remy's cartoon, we had a, picked a random person. And congratulations to Jade Ezenzimmer, she will receive the original copy of Remy's cartoon of the uh, 50th anniversary of Secretariat winning the Belmont Stakes. It was Secretariat in Sham in Heaven, Secretariat saying to Sham, come on, guy, it's been 50 years. Let's get over it. So uh, terrific. Congratulations to our winner. And that was a real neat um, thing that we did last week. It was, was a lot of fun. So, hey, and we want to remind you that the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by Keeneland, home of the world's yearling sale. The energy, magic, and momentum of the September yearling sale returns September 11th through the 23rd. Learn more at theworldsyearlingsale.com. That's once again, theworldsyearlingsale.com. We'll be right back after this message from Keeneland. If this place could talk, it would roar. It would say, this is racing, this beating heart in the heart of horse country, steady and strong beneath the roar, reminding us why, for the love of the horse, for generations to come. The best two-year-old by legendary sire, Quality Road. Get back, a million five. Very, very impressive debut, cantering home. Could not have been more impressive. Coast to coast in the American Pharaoh. He's the real deal. Undefeated and unchallenged at two. 
He's just too good. He wins the Breeders' Cup Juvenile. Cornish. Cornish, the newest champion to Coolmore America. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by Coolmore. This past Saturday on the Preakness Undercard, a highly touted son of Justify picked up his first stakes win when Arabian Lion won the Sir Barton Stakes, prompting trainer Bob Baffert to remark that he should have brought him in the Preakness. Baffert said he may head next to the Belmont Stakes. We'll see about that a little bit down the road, but a big performance from Arabian Lion, and congratulations to the son of Justify. Well, Randy, I did ask you to save your thoughts about the having a meltdown story and, and the highs and lows of, um, of of the sport and what happened. And, you know, uh, we talked about this uh, after the Derby. Uh, we had hoped to talk about anything but this very uh, awful and, and difficult subject. Again, we had a, a fatality on uh, Preakness Day in the undercard race in the Chick Lang Stakes, having a meltdown, trained by Bob Baffert, suffered a fatal injury. Um, don't want it to happen uh, ever, but especially don't want it to happen when uh, the NBC cameras are there paying attention and doing their job, reporting on it. And um, it made the story even messier that it was Bob Baffert because of, of what uh, has been circulating uh, around him and, and the controversy, whether you think it's fair or not, uh, the controversy that has followed him uh, going back through the Medina spirit and uh, uh, story, uh, his suspensions from Ch Churchill Downs and uh, some other um, issues. Um, and I always like to look to see what the mainstream media has to say uh, about these things, because I think what they say is a lot more important than what the racing people say, because I think racing's fate is in the hands of the, um, the man on the street and, and uh, the court of public opinion. And when you get a Baltimore Sun headline above the fold on the front page of the paper, in the main uh, paper in Baltimore, it was the the uh, paper in Baltimore, national conflict, national treasures, victory in the race con uh, contrasted with horses, a horse's death earlier in the day, highlighting the controversy in a historic but deadly sport. Tough to read that stuff, Randy. Yeah, it's scary for for those of us who love the sport and who've been around it for all of our adult lives and even not so adult. It's uh, it's a really, really scary time because uh, we're talking about now uh, what the statistics show is probably an all time low in horse fatalities, uh, dramatic decreases in Santa Anita pretty dramatic increases in Maryland at Laurel and Pimlico um, because of all the steps that have been taken uh, over the past three or four years to try to ensure horse safety, that the steps that are that are still, uh, you know, still being bolstered and, and, and still being perfected. And yet, despite all that, despite the numbers that say the sport is safer than it's ever been for horses, you get a couple more horse deaths at Churchill Downs, Post Kentucky Derby, which make headlines in Kentucky, uh, and then you get this uh, on national TV, and we know that there's no way that horse deaths will ever be zero in the sport. It's impossible. But will anything be satisfactory above zero when these things happen um, on a high-profile stage, uh, like we saw at the Kentucky Derby? I mean, we were doing the Pat Day Mile when the horse broke down during the Pat Day Mile. And here in the, uh, you know, in the Chick Lang, uh, it was like a dagger when you're doing the race. I mean, it's you know, even for those of us who've been around the sport, you and I have been around the sport for so long. No telling how many times we've seen something like that happen. And it's still it still just gets you. It gets you every time. It doesn't even have to be a special horse. It doesn't have to be a stakes horse. It just be an average horse, you know, a poor horse. It doesn't really matter. Um, but when we saw it happen uh, to having a meltdown, it was just like, oh, my God, again. Um, and it probably helps that for people that don't know that much about the sport and question it, um, to see the reaction of Baffert after he won the Preakness, right? And I talked to Kenny Rice, who was on the Bob Baffert trail all day long. And Kenny was back at the barn with Bob, and he said he felt like that he was basically Bob's uh, counselor, 
that he was actually just crying at the barn. And other people in the barn were very emotional as well about the horse. And and Bob, you know, he wanted to interview Bob. It was in the format for us to talk to Bob. But Bob said, I can't do it. And Kenny said, I, I know I could see that there's no way that he could do it. Um, and then later after the Preakness, he got emotional on NBC thinking, you know, saying that it's never going to be, uh, you know, he's never going to be happy, really, truly happy about having a melt about, uh, excuse me, National Treasure's win. Because every time he thinks about National Treasure, he'll also think about losing, having a meltdown and how emotional that was for everybody. So, yeah, I don't know what else to say, Bill. I mean, it's it's just a frightening thing that uh, to see the reaction of the mainstream media and the reaction, as you said, possibly of the man on the street. I mean, how do you convince them that these horses are for the most part, extremely well taken care of. And that, like I always say, the dirty little secret in horse racing is not that the horses are treated poorly because they're not. It's that if there is a dirty little secret, it's that the horses are treated better than the people that take care of them. If you want to look for a dirty little secret, that's it, the living conditions of the people who take care of the horses. But yeah. how are you going to get that message across? Yeah. A, a couple of thoughts on, on the subject. And, you know, those of us inside the game, we're all very happy, like you mentioned, that, that the sport is doing a much better job. The numbers are coming down. But that leaves us with the, that leaves our best message to the public. We're killing fewer horses than ever. That is never going to win the day. And, you know, we also know that uh, the number will never be zero. And I think we're, we're getting close to a point where the social license to, to continue horse racing um, you know, is in jeopardy because I'm not sure the public will ever, not everybody, but a, a lot of people will ever support a, a game or say that it should thrive and continue if any horses die. I mean, even if it's 10 a year or something like that, and, and we'll never get there. But, you know, I, I, I think we're, we're actually have to look at something like that. Um, and I want to bring up another subject, and I, I think that this doesn't get nearly enough debate, and maybe it's time to restart the uh, the the, the, uh, the debate about synthetic surfaces. And right now, here's the numbers uh, from the equine injury database. On dirt, there's 1.44 fatalities per thousand starters. On synthetic, it's 0.41. It means a horse is three and a half times more likely to die on a dirt surface versus a synthetic surface. So if we're saying that we're doing everything possible to keep these horses safe, we're not. Because, uh, you know, the, the, we have gone away from the synthetic surfaces, which used to be all the California tracks, Keeneland. I understand why we got away from it. Um, I don't think it's practical because uh, of the economics of horse racing, is particularly the breeding industry that we will do away with dirt racing and make it all synthetic. But there's there's a big answer to our problems and you know nobody is nobody is heading in that direction. I mean Gulfstream put it in but that but didn't replace the dirt track. Belmont's going to put it in. But those were their adjunct uh, tracks to to have a place to run when when it's rainy and, and they're off the turf. So, you know, are we doing the everything in our power? Not unless we go back to synthetic surfaces, we're not. Yeah, I mean, that's a good point. But to, to your earlier point, even on synthetic surfaces, you will get the occasional right. horse breakdown and and it's never going to be zero. And there are always going to be people, you know, PETA is always going to be able to point to a certain number. There were this many horse deaths in America in 2023. You know, this is a barbaric sport. It's got to be ended. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, what I try to explain to people, uh, friends of mine who who aren't huge racing fans and they, and they question me about things like this. And it, you know, I mean, I just have to say, look, these horses, first of all, were born for this. They wouldn't even be in existence mm -hmm. if it weren't for thoroughbred racing. Um, they're worth a lot of money. They are extremely well cared for, for the most part. You're always going to have your bad apples in any walk of life, in any sport, you're going to have trainers, unfortunately, who don't take care of their horses as well as some other trainers. 
and you just try to weed those those people out as much as you can. But for the most part, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, but horses have personal trainers, they have dietitians, they have dentists, they have, you know, all of these things at their at their, you know, 24 seven call, basically. Um, and that they're they're loved and they're really, really cared for. And that in the wild horses, if you just turn the horses out in the field and said, OK, we're going to let it be born free. You know, they're going to have accidents in the paddock. They're going to have accidents in fields. And and you you will never in any circumstance do away with all accidents involving uh, a high strung thoroughbred racehorse that likes to run, whether it's run in the field or run on the racetrack. Getting that message across to people, though, and not sound heartless while you're doing it and not sound like you're just apologizing for horse racing is uh, is a tough balance. Yeah, it sure is. Well, again, uh, two and a half weeks from today, the uh, Belmont Stakes, and we will keep our fingers crossed that uh, it is finally a day, like most days of racing, where nothing happens and everybody gets around the racetrack safely. So um, we had hoped that would be the case in the Preakness, and it wasn't. But uh, we look forward to uh, better days ahead, and hopefully uh, things can die down a little bit. Let's keep all those horses and jockeys safe as best we can. There are just nine days left until the $400,000 Grade 2 2023 Penn Mile to be run June 2nd at Hollywood Penn National Racecourse. 49 horses have been nominated to the Mile of 16th Grass event, with several top contenders expected, including Major Dude from the Todd Pletcher Barn, winner of the Kitten's Joy Stakes and the Pilgrim, Behind Enemy Lines, Jack Sisterson's the trainer, and he's the winner of the Cutler Bay Stakes at Gulfstream. Gaslight Dancer from the Mike Maker Barn, winner of the Palisades at Keeneland. And Mark Cassie's expected to send out Bobby O, winner of the With Anticipation Stakes at Saratoga. The Penn Mile caps a $950,000 day with six stakes races. And there'll be a special guest announcer, Larry Colmas, will call the card. He, of course, is the voice of the major races on NBC. We'll be right back after this message from the Penn Mile. 2023 marks the 10th celebration of Penn National's signature event, Penn Mile Night. Friday, June 2nd at Hollywood Casino at Penn National Racecourse. There are four Pennsylvania bred stakes, each with a $100,000 purse, plus the $150,000 Penn O's. It's all capped off by the $400,000 Grade 2 Penn Mile. Friday, June 2nd at Penn National. First post, 5 p.m. For more, go to pahpba.com. The PA Horse Breeders Association presents the Pennsylvania Stallion Series. Six races for PA Sire, PA bred two-year-olds at parks. Two $100,000 contests at five and a half furlongs. On August 21st, PA Day at the Races. September 23rd, PA Derby Day has two races at six and a half furlongs, both with a $150,000 purse. And in December, two races going long, each worth $200,000. For more, go to pabred.com. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by the Pennsylvania Horse Breeders Association. The Pennsylvania Bred Champions of 2022 were announced this week. And as expected, Caravelle took home a lot of hardware. She was the 2022 PA Bred Horse of the Year, older female, female sprinter, and turf female. Some other Pennsylvania Bred Divisional Champions Two-year-old female went to Flor de Sombra. Gordian Knot was the champion two-year-old male. Three-year-old female was Morning Matcha. The champion three-year-old male was Nimitz Class. And that was just as a three-year-old in 2022. He's already got a head start on champion older male with how he's been running in Maryland this winter and spring. The older male and male sprinter award went to For the Love of Bourbon and the champion turf male by land and sea. And speaking of Caravelle, of course, she will be headed next to Royal Ascot to compete there with trainer Brad Cox making the trip to England for that event for the very first time. The fastest horse of the week is brought to you by Windstar, which stands a lot of fast stallions, if you think about it, including one with a connection to this week's fastest horse. More on that later. Fastest horse of this week, based on buyer speed figures. If you're watching the races on Saturday at Pimlico, no doubt who that would be. Straight No Chaser, who 
scored a dynamic seven and a half length win in the Maryland Sprint at six furlongs. Straight no chaser. Get this, went six furlongs in 108.27 to earn a buyer speed figure of 107. That's a career high, not just the highest of the week. And it also happened to be a stakes record in the Maryland Sprint by almost a full half second. The previous stakes record, 108.74, was set by New York Central back in 2019. Straight No Chaser, owned by My Racehorse, trained by Dan Blacker. That's two big wins in a row for Straight No Chaser. He previously won a seven, an allowance race at Oakland Park by a similar margin uh, in his most recent start. Now, what does Straight No Chaser have to do with the Windstar Fast Sire this week? Well, Straight No Chaser is the son of Spitester, who is by Spitestown. Standing stud at Windstar is Nashville, another fast son of Spitestown. Nashville, for example, set a new track record at Keeneland, 107.89, faster by nearly a second than the Breeders' Cup Sprint later that afternoon. And you talk about speed. He ran 21 and change opening quarter miles in six of his eight starts and sub 44 half miles on three different occasions. So if speed is key, look no further than Nashville, who stands at one star for a fee of only $15,000. Next, the TDN Writers Room is brought to you by The Green Group, a tax accounting and advisory firm specializing in horse racing and designed to save you taxes. Welcome in now the Green Group guest of the week, fresh off his win in the Preakness Award National Treasure Hall of Fame jockey, John Velasquez. John, thanks so much for joining us. Congratulations. And the script for this race was a 23 and four first quarter, a 48 and four half, a 113 and two three quarters. National Treasure was a length and a half clear. Nobody breathing down your neck. If you could have written the script, could you have written it any better than that? No, it was just uh, one of those things that worked out perfect. You know, uh, you you plan it. Um, and you don't really dream to have a trip the way that we had it. You know, it's so like, you know, after, you know, the warm up and everything, the only thing that I was worried about uh, so I read a uh, warm up his horse in the, in the post parade and uh, so like, well, he's going to try to get closer to the pace. And if he wants to get closer to the pace, he's going to have to go fast enough, you know, to go across, uh, across with me. So when I broke and I took a pick to that side that he was there, so I started drifting my horse out, to, you know, uh, right before the wire and pushed him out thinking that he might try to go up, you know, and, and try to get to the pace or do something. And then when I pushed him out, he, he started grabbing his horse back and he went backwards. So then I want to look, he, okay, he's out of there. And then went right back to the, to the inside and that kind of slowed the pace uh, really well, you know, when, uh, when he took back from, from the other horse. And from there, you know, it, it was pretty easy though. You know, I just kind of waited for them to get closer to me. And when the three, six, from the three, eight pole, five, 16 pole, he started getting, putting the pressure on the horse, on my horse. Um, and after that, well, really, it was a really good fight down the lane. So I was very proud of my horse that, you know, he, he allowed me to do what I wanted to do and respond for the things that I wanted to do with him. So very lucky, very best. You were playing it pretty coy all week long. Everybody and their sister was talking about how it looked like National Treasure was going to get an uncontested lead and was going to have a huge advantage. And every time anybody asked you about that, you said, well, I just want to get him in a good rhythm. I, you know, I'm not really thinking about it's, that. Or, it's, True, though, but the, the whole the whole thing with him because he doesn't break very good uh, out of the gate, though. You know, he's, he has he has not break a lot few times out of the gate. So I was playing pretty cool about it. Though. You know, I'm, I'm I don't want to put that pressure on me or in, even in the horse that I'm going to break out of there. I'm going to hustle him, and all of a sudden he he's going to run off with me and go on a, a faster pace. So I had in my head if he breaks slow, I'm just going to let him put himself into the place instead of me. Shoot, I mean, making him do something that I didn't want to do with him. So I didn't want to put that on me and my head that I. If, if it breaks out of there slow, I'm, I'm going to ask him to do something. All of a sudden, it's going much faster than I wanted to. So I want to put that in my head that if he breaks slow, leave him alone no matter what and let him take you to, to the position that he wants. Well, that's, that's what I, I was constantly going in my head that, like, don't overdo it. Though, you know, if you overdo it, you're going to go too fast. If you don't, you know, so it's going to be uh, an unnatural pace for, for, for the horse. Though. And that's, that, that's, that's the way I was trying to do. I was trying to pull myself into the spot that, don't overdo it. Don't let anybody put you something in the head that you're going to be overdo things, though. <laughs> if, if that makes any sense for you guys. <laughs> it does. 
And, and John, even with that great trip, you, this horse still had to dig down deep in the stretch. I mean, at the 16th pole, this race is going to go either way. Um, what did he show you? Did you know he had that kind of tenacity? You know what? Once I got to the 316 pole and the other horse got to me, though, and then actually to the 8th pole, he kind of put the head and head, and head with, with, with my horse, and he didn't go by. I knew I was going to come back out of him, though, you know, because when I went left-handed, he responded right away, and I knew. I mean, he was fighting for it. Not only that, the gallop ball was incredible, you know. I have a little bit of, I know the horse a little bit more now, and that's the reason I wanted to, you know, when Bob called me, to so maybe put the little, little blinkers on, on him. And the reason I did that, not to put any speeds on anything, maybe just to get a little more attention. He's a horse that he can be on the need of you, and so all of a sudden he, he lets go, you know, like he, you don't know if he's on the need of you or not or not really pay attention, like he's, he's very spotty. And all of a sudden, after the race, he gallops out really, really strong. So I thought maybe with the blinkers, we keep his mind in the business and uh, concentrate on what he needs to do. And when he when the other horse got to me in the 316 pole, I made sure, you know, he was running before he got to me. And and believe me, he he, he really put every effort that I asked him to do and, and, and put every, every bit of it right to the wire. And his gallop out was really good. So I was knew that he had something on the need of me even before that, the race before, even though he'd been pretty consistent, but he's not giving me everything that he's he's capable of doing. Um, and actually, he put it, everything on, on the breakfast day. I'm going to open up another envelope here while we're talking about this stretch run. Right? We've all seen multiple times uh, how IRAD can sort of push the envelope sometimes. Having watched the head-on several times, I'm of the belief that even if Blazing Sevens had gotten his head down in front, his number probably would have come down. What I believe what, so. I, I, I think yeah. I would. I think I believe so too. Like, and hope and, and thankfully it didn't go to that, you know, because I, I'd rather they win the way I won, though. You know what I mean? Uh, but it could it could have gone to that if it happens that he beat me by a nose or just by a head, you know, and then it would be a controversial, you know, <laughs> a call in, in the race, you know. But uh, you know, it's nothing that we can do. That's his style of writing and the things he does. His his his, his thing. Um, it works for him. Um, so I just do my thing. <laughs> Johnny, I want to pick up on that because I was actually going to ask you some very similar questions. You just said that's his thing. But as a veteran rider and somebody who obviously, uh, you know, has been around forever and has achieved all this and, and is a mentor to young riders, are you OK with that? I mean, some people say he's a dirty rider. Well, I don't think he's a dirty rider. I think he's definitely over, over, over passes the line and, and does it a lot, though, you know. Um, listen, I, I have talked to him many times. I try to teach him, you know, that, that we, we can be aggressive. But we have a line that, that, we, um, that we have to put in there. And, and it's hard to control. For him, it's hard to control, though. You know, I, I, I don't know. I, for me, I've been riding for a long time. So I always try to take that edge as much as I can, but try not to, you know, cross those lines. I mean, we make mistakes. I, I try to make the less mistakes possible so I don't cross that line. So um, it's, it's about where you learn it or not. In the aftermath of the Kentucky Derby and the pace meltdown with reincarnate and all that, um, I've been told it wasn't a slam dunk that you were going to actually have the ride on National Treasure. What, what did you have to do and say to advocate? Uh, to make sure that uh, that you got to keep them out for the previous. I'm I'm really surprised that you actually found that out. Actually, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you got a good connection, I guess. Well, I had to plead my case. I had I I called. I made a few phone calls and 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 I plead my case. What happens and what didn't happen? And, uh, and I think when you explain yourself to the situations of what happened in the Derby and 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 the prior, you know, and other races, just going to leave it at that. <laughs> um, but when, when you're left alone and, and you can communicate with one person, uh, the things that can happen in the race before it happens, so, you know, before predict what happened, I think it's much better when the jockey and the, and the one person to talk about what could happen in the race. And, and I think that's what happened, though. You know, I, I'm going to say that I'm, I'm really strong of my beliefs, the way I believe uh, how to ride the races. And if I don't put my input into what could happen and something goes wrong, then it, and then things kind of goes bad, though, you know. So I had to go back and make a few phone calls and make sure that explains uh, that when I'm left alone or when I'm actually communicating with somebody, you know, face to face that I can, I, I can, I can predict what could happen. I think the outcome is much better. 
Uh, John, we're recording this on a Tuesday, um, so maybe the story will change between now uh, and and whenever this uh, podcast uh, sees the light of day. But uh, best of my knowledge, and maybe Randy, he's really on top of these things, can correct me. Uh, Baffert has not yet committed national treasure to the Belmont, but it appears that's the, the direction he's going um, by just by the mere fact that he shipped the horse to New York. What about the mile and a half for him? What do you see from him, and how do you think he'll handle that very difficult challenge? You know, like I said, you know, his gallop us are really strong every time, though. You know, so he's always have given me uh, the feeling that he can do more, you know. Um, and obviously put it together in the pricksness and it put a really good effort. And his gallop out was really, really good. So I, I think, I mean, it shouldn't be a problem. The way he gallops out, he's always given more and more. He just had to put it together, though, you know. And um, when you ask him to do something, his body, that's the only thing, his body. So he, he kind of goes and... and and kind of hesitates and goes again, and all of a sudden you you get off of you, you know you pass the wire, you put your hands down, and he gallops out like you can't pull him up. So I, I think with him it's it's just about getting his mind and and, and focus and stay focused on what he needs to do. So that I, I don't think that this thing is a problem. So you were at it wasn't just National Treasure on Saturday. You were probably on the three most impressive winners on the Saturday card, at least as far as I saw. What, what are your thoughts on Arabian Lion and his win in the Sir Barton and also straight no chaser in the Maryland sprint? Yeah. It's and, awesome. and it's funny that you ask because Arabian uh, Lion, again, is a horse that shows a lot of talent. And like I said, maybe a couple of months ago when I when I, uh, when I I rode him in, in Santa Anita last race and come back to Bob and I was like, man, maybe he doesn't want to go that far. I don't know. I can't answer because he, it was a, a sensible pace. It wasn't very fast. Um, and then he just didn't didn't really give me anything. Obviously, then he went back to Le- uh, to Lexington. He was a good second, and then I wrote him, and he was very impressed. And I said to Bob, maybe he just needed to grow and, and figure that out. You know, I'm not sure. He's he feels stronger. He feels like he's more secure about himself, and he comes up and show up. You know, Preston State the way he did. You know, so very impressive. And the other horse, the sprinter, very very fast. I mean, I. It gives me goosebumps to think about, you know, having a horse that way. You know, he, he ran in Oakland and he, he ran pretty much the same way. Um, and the other day I said to Dan, uh, I'm not going to take any hold of him. I know that I got one horse really speed in the inside. I'm just going to let him break and put himself what he wanted. Want and he says, you do what you need to do. So I was like, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> um, and it's just like, come on, let's go and win a race, though, you know. Uh, I mean, this horse, when he popped out of there, I, I mean, that door opened, he was so quick that I would just sit on him, hold him to myself and into the main and just let him do his thing. And then after eighth of a mile, I mean, I, I, I see I rat inside of me and I said, OK, I, I can't leave you there. I'm going to take you out of there and just let my horse kind of sit where, where he was comfortable. And going around the turn, I just feel it so well on the end of the meet that when he come to me in the quarter pole that I give him the head, he's less like going so fast, so fast, so I'm thinking, oh my God, how fast can these, these hurts can run, though, you know, and I didn't hit him, I kind of, you know, got down in the eight pole and, and wrote him out, and man, so excited, I mean, really excited to have a, an experience like that, and uh, very happy for Dan and the whole group, you know, and giving me the opportunity to ride the horse, because, I mean, I just picked up this horse back in Oakland and a month ago, and all of a sudden, look at the, what kind of horse he's become, so very nice, very, very, very happy. As one of the all-time greats, you still probably love to hear the words, just do what you think, right? Yeah, yeah. I think I think it's, it works better when things work out. You know, so you, we have, we have at least, you know, I do my homework and I see all the things that can happen in the race. And um, so you have something in mind and hopefully the horse, you know, I like you to do what you want to do. Um, but when you have something in mind and it works out that way and the horse telling you, you know, all those things, man, it, it doesn't I mean, the feeling that you get is, is doesn't get any better. Uh, John, the Preakness was one of the few things on your resume you had not accomplished. You get that now. Is there anything left? Um, if you look at, you know, maybe you've got a good seven, eight years left to ride at 51 years old. <laughs> thank you. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to go that far. But okay. I'm having fun right now. I am. I'm, right. so, I'm really having a lot of fun, you know, with the little I'm riding, the little that I'm picking up here and there. If I still get an opportunity to ride these horses, that, that you know, the excitement, you know, the the fire, that you know, that, that's what keeps me here, and and really I'm enjoying what I'm doing now, um, 
and I, I'm really happy in, in the position that I am right now. So really, if you get the opportunities that I'm getting right now, I'm enjoying it. I stick around for a little while. And obviously, I have to be healthy, healthy enough to be here. Um, and thankfully, I am healthy. I'm getting these opportunities. I'm having fun. So everything's kind of sticking together right now. But the day that I feel that I'm not getting the opportunity, I'm not happy, you know, and, and healthy enough, hopefully I can say that I walk out of it, you know, being healthy enough, walking out of, you know, our business. Um, I think that that will, will go away. You know what I mean? I have to be happy and, and enjoying what I'm doing. Yeah. So I want to segue then to a totally different subject. And um, the, it, it's something that the racing industry is now talking about that we probably should have been talking about a long time ago. And it's very unfortunate that two jockeys over the last six months or so have committed suicide, but it has brought the subject of mental health for jockeys to the forefront and people now look like they're really ready to do something about it. Uh, you, not only are you a great writer, a uh, Hall of Fame writer, but you're the head of the Jockeys Guild, so I know that you've been paying a lot of attention to this. Could you just weigh in on this subject? I mean, what do people need to understand about the pressures that jockeys face and what might lead some people to go to a bad place? You know, I think it's a really um, tough subject to touch about it, and it's just because it's a stigma that, that, that uh, is always behind it. And I think if we look... I mean, even our, our own kids right now, so much pressure they, they put on, on our kids now in school and everything. So put that a thousand percent more to a jockey that, you know, that is working and trying to make make uh, make a living out of it and try to stay healthy, try to, you know, stay positive, losing weight and all this stuff just have to go through there, you know, working every day, seven days a week. Uh, working for free, basically, because most jockeys work in the morning and, and, and they work for free, basically. You're just going around to, you know, trying to get mounts and trying to get an opportunity. So, I mean, put that all in perfected side. Oh, what the jockeys go through. Um, it's incredible. You know, the, the life of the jockeys is, is not all climbers. I'm, I'm one, of the, one, one of the lucky ones, one of the blessed ones, I always say, um, that I get the opportunities that I've been get, I've been given all these years and, and stay healthy the way I've been... Uh, healthy all these years to be where I am today. And even myself and my positions and, and, and my thing, I go to my swings ups and down just like everybody else though, you know? So it's really tough to explain uh, the world out there that all the emotions that you go through and all the, the things you have, I mean, a perfect example, I mean, how to make a phone call, you know, just to make sure that I'm staying on this horse, you know, going to, to, um, uh, to the pregnancy. So all those things behind the scenes, that's really tough and really, um, a lot of weight on the jockey's mind, though, you know, is 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 incredible. So putting the all this all this unprofessional right now. Not only that, though, so I'm, I just got off a meeting for two and a half hours about the same thing that we're talking about, you know, the mel, mel, uh, mental health. Um, and uh, at least something is happening now, though. You know, we we had a meeting just today uh, about it, trying to put uh, uh, people in place so people can. You know, show up and and talk to uh, to the jockeys, and not just jockeys, as it's rider riders or even people who work in the racetrack as well. But mainly, the focus is right now on the jockeys because what you just said, we just have two guys basically com uh, commit suicide, and we're trying to help and bring this to awareness that there is help out there for anybody who needs it, and especially the jockeys, they all the things that we go through. And I, I, I'm 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 very op optimistic that you know this. Thing, could open the doors for for a lot of us and and a lot of jockeys and and anybody who works in the racetrack that that maybe they open up a little more uh they, they can talk about it very good well john velasquez thank you so much for joining us on the tdn riders room podcast being the green group guest of the week and uh congratulations on your preakness win good luck if you get the, to the belmont with national treasure and i think you're selling yourself short i'm gonna bet you Seven more good years in the saddle. How about that? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. Because, of course, you're still riding at the top of your game, and there's no doubt about that. So, once again, Johnny, thanks so much for joining us, and we'll catch up with you again soon. Thank you. As this week's Green Group Guest of the Week, John Velasquez will receive a free one-hour tax consultation from the Green Group. For more information on how the Green Group can save you on your taxes, go to www.greenco.com. Are you paying too much in taxes? The Green Group can help. There's a reason the most successful owners, breeders, and horsemen select the Green Group as their tax advisors. They save you money and share successful strategies. 
Over the past 40 years, the Green Group founder, Len Green, has owned and bred some of the best racehorses in the history of the sport, like Eclipse award-winning champions Jaywalk and Wonder Wheel. His DJ stable competes at the highest level and has received the game's most prestigious honors. Len Green's in-depth, hands-on industry knowledge, combined with cutting-edge tax-saving strategies, has produced positive results for his clientele and has made the Green Group the top-rated accounting and tax firm in the thoroughbred business. For a confidential and complimentary consultation, contact us at 732-634-5100 or visit our website at www.greenco.com. The Green Group, proven strategies to save you taxes. Quality Road, proving Lane's Ends, tried and true stallion making tradition. A tradition that leads to success for our partners and our stallions. Quality Road has sired multiple Eclipse Award and Grade 1 winners, including champion two-year-old Colt Corniche, champion two-year-old filly Caledonia Road, champion three-year-old filly Abel Tasman, and multiple Grade 1 winner City of Light. He's a leader of his generation. Quality Road, a stallion that stands above the rest. The TD and Riders Room also brought to you by Lane's Inn. This week's Lane's Inn Sire of the Week, Quality Road, who is now the sire of a classic winner, National Treasure. You can add that to his long list of accomplishments. National Treasure was Quality Road's 72nd stakes winner and his 15th grade one winner. Quality Road leads the stallion roster at Lane's Inn for a fee of $200,000. Let's start to look ahead at the Belmont Stakes. We don't have a full idea of who's going to go uh, yet. Right now, there would be, if National Treasure runs, there would kind of be a big four. Forte, Angel of Empire, Tappet Trice, National Treasure, some other nice horses in there, but I think those four would command most of the attention. But Randy, to me, Forte is going to be the, the big story here. Um, we know why he was out of the Derby and Preakness. Now he's finally going to get a chance to run in a triple crown race. Todd Pletcher gave him a workout uh, over the weekend, said all systems are go. But as good as this horse is, and I still think you can make a case that he's the best three-year-old in the country. Uh, I mean, he beat um, Mage twice, and Mage went on to win the Kentucky Derby. But he's going to have to come into the Belmont having not run in 10 weeks, um, having never run more than a mile and an eighth, and missed a couple of workouts because of this foot issue that, that kept him out of the uh, Kentucky Derby, then put him on the vets list uh, in Kentucky, which uh, kept him out of the Preakness. Um, if Todd Pletcher thinks he's good enough and ready to go, uh, that's all I need to know. Todd is not a guy that makes many mistakes. I don't think you're going to nope. see a short forte show up in this race. And I'm looking forward to seeing him run because, you know, we, we kind of, you know, he's been out of sight, out of mind a little bit. He was very good horse, the two-year-old champion. Uh, Pletcher has a great record in the Belmont Stakes, but uh, are these obstacles going to be a little bit too much for him? Yeah, it, it's it's really interesting, isn't it? I mean, Jerry and uh, Jerry Bailey and I were talking after the Preakness. So, I was, so who's going to run in the Belmont? Actually, we started going through the list, and I and I said Forte. I said, do you think Forte would run in the Belmont? And Jerry said, No, no way. And I said, I don't think so either. No way. I didn't think there was any chance that Todd would bring him back off 10 weeks and go from the Florida Derby at a mile and an eighth to the Belmont Stakes at a mile and a half. But I'll echo what you said. I mean, Todd has forgotten more about, you know, certainly about training than we'll ever even pretend to know. And he's, you know, he's so good about spotting his horses in the right races that you just have to give him the benefit of the doubt when it comes to something like this. Now, you also know the Mike Rapoli. Uh, is all about running again in the Belmont Stakes and trying to defend his uh, his his title from last year, but uh, you know he really makes it interesting. I think, and if he runs, there's no doubt in my mind that Todd will have him uh, cranked up and uh, and ready to get the mile and a half because that's what uh, that's what Todd does. Tap it Trice, though, I still think is the horse to beat in the Belmont. I mean, when he won the Tampa Bay Derby, I think you and I both said at the time, there's right. your Belmont Stakes winner. And even though he was kind of a no-show in the Kentucky Derby, uh, I think he's probably going to be the most talented horse in the Belmont field. And to me, I think he's still the horse to beat. Maybe that'll just make the price a little better the, the way he <laughs> ran in the Derby. We shall see. Um, and once again, with Mage not coming back in the Belmont, a still another year 
Not a single horse contested all three Triple Crown races. And as I've been preaching for 25 years now or so, it's time to change <laughs> Triple Crown. <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. That's, that's an inside joke a little bit there, folks. Hey, uh, Randy, before we wrap up, I, I want to uh, just talk about uh, one more thing. And, and you spent a lot of your years uh, working and covering racing in Texas. And what a mess we have down there now. And uh, the Dan Ross and the Thoroughbred Daily News did a real good job of, of uh, assessing the situation um, and also kind of some of the ridiculousness of what's going on down there. The, uh, to, to put it in a nutshell, the Texas Racing Commission believes that by law, they're not allowed to be part of HISA. And if they're not part of HISA, they can't send their simulcasting signal outside the state of Texas. So what we have now, both Sam Houston and Lone Star is, is the handle is pathetic. Um, Sam Houston handle is off 93%. Now, you would say that that would be the quickest way to go out of business, but they get so much of their purse money from a, a tax that they, uh, tax money that comes in from uh, equestrian products. Uh, I guess in Texas, if you buy a saddle or something, uh, the, the tax money goes to racing. So their, their purses haven't dropped all that much, but with no, um, uh, revenue coming in from handle in this is obviously not sustainable so we're you know what is going to happen in the future of texas racing it's up in the air but uh he, he interviewed amy cook who is the um uh the commissioner of the uh, head of the texas racing commission and um I'll, I'll i'll put it this way this is not the sharpest knife in the drawer uh no. ms cook um this here's a quote uh, uh, about what's going on in texas that you can't believe someone would be so dumb to say this She's uh, supporting what's going on there. She says, I'm all, well, that, that's one other quote. Um, I'm, I'm going to, maybe I'll get to that one, but here's the one. I would say, uh, and I've said it to a few other folks I've talked to, if you're out of state and you want to watch Texas horses, then come to the track. You don't have to watch it on TV. Wow. I, does she have a clue or what, or not have a clue or what? I circled that quote. If you, did, if you didn't bring it up, I was going to bring it up. And, and here's the punchline. When she says, if, you, if you're out of state and you want to watch Texas horses, then come to the track. She's talking about a Texas track. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can't go to your track out of state exactly, yeah. to watch yeah. the horses because they're not there. They're not right. simulcasting out of state. So in other words, she's saying if you live in uh, Massachusetts and you've got a horse running in Texas and you want to watch Texas races, get, get your ass to Texas and come to a Texas track and watch. That's the most ridiculous she, she may be incredibly intelligent, but she certainly knows nothing about horse racing and about what makes horse racing tick. In 2023, to say something like that is just unfathomable and just is the perfect example of, uh, of how things have gone kind of, kind of sideways in Texas right now. They, the, uh, the, the, the purse supplements that you mentioned with all the, um, the money, the tax money taken from the, uh, the ancillary uh, purchases that have to do with racing and applied to the purses. That was being advertised, and rightfully so, as a real panacea for Texas racing. It was really going to boost the purses, which have suffered because of uh, politics in Texas, because of anti-gambling politics in Texas. You can't have account wagering. You can't bet on your telephone in Texas. You can't log on to a computer if you live in Texas to bet on the races. There's no casinos in Texas. So racing can't get any benefit uh, from casinos at the track or slot machines at the track or anything like that. So Texas racing really needed a shot in the arm like this, uh, like like this, these purse increases that were going to come. But then those now are completely offset and then some by the lack of interstate simulcasting. So I agree with you. I don't know what's going to happen to Texas racing if they don't solve this. And I'm sure they will. You know, ultimately, when all is said and done. Uh, if HISA survives the various court challenges, if it survives what might wind up being a Supreme Court, a U.S. Supreme Court uh, verdict of some kind, then Texas racing is going to be, you know, dragged along into the 21st century and then all will be well. But in the meantime, uh, it's a lot of money being left on the table for Texas horsemen and they're not happy about it at all. Yeah, and, and Dan did a real good job of just letting Amy Cook's words make her look very foolish. Here's that other quote. It says, I am aware of only, only one human being 
that is upset in all of Texas about this, the approach we're taking. Only one human being. Then Dan, after that quote, went on to quote like four people <laughs> that were saying, I'm very upset about what's happening here in Texas racing. And I'm sure he could have, if he uh, <laughs> put the time and effort into it, um, could have found four or 500 yes. that, that would have been um, upset about Texas racing. So, uh, yeah, let's, let, they, you know, the Texas Racing Commission, the you know, everybody else is saying that they're they're wrong. They they can legally simulcast the races, and uh, you know they they need to just stop this nonsense because it, it's it's uh, going to kill Texas horse racing. So, um, anyways, we shall see. All right, how about the XBTV workout of the week? And the XBTV work of the week is the chosen Ron who worked four furlongs in forty seven on May twenty one at Santa Anita for trainer Eric Krulljack. Hard knock in California, Brett has won six straight starts, all six in stakes races, including three this year. You may recall that the chosen Braun was the fastest horse of the week when he won the Tisnow Stakes back in February and is nominated for Sunday's Thor's Echo Stakes at San Anita. So we've made history today, the first ever horse to be both an XBTV work of the week and the fastest horse of the week that goes to chosen Braun. And we'll be right back after this message from XBTV. All the thrills. Fraction of the bills. Experience the power of the partnership. Change your life, make new friends, and compete at the highest level of thoroughbred racing. West Point Thoroughbreds, the gold standard in racing partnerships. Visit westpointtb.com. The TDN Riders Room is brought to you by West Point Thoroughbreds. Joining a West Point partnership can launch you into the winner's circle and give you instant camaraderie with your fellow owners. Well, this week, King's Ovation continued on his winning ways for West Point and trainer Dale Romans, giving the owner-trainer combination their fourth straight win together. West Point owns King's Ovation in partnership with Peacock Stables, which includes NBC Sports veterans Tom Hammond, Mike Battaglia, and Chris Collinsworth. To learn more, go to westpointtb.com. That's once again, visit westpointtb.com. Well, that's a wrap on this week's show. It's been a lot of fun. We miss Zoe Cabin. Hopefully she'll be back next week, but I want to thank Randy Moss for uh, joining us today. Also a very special Green Group guest of the week, John Velasquez. Our associate producers, Katie Petruniak and Anthony LaRocca, and our editors, Alita LaRocca and Nathan Wilkinson, and what would be a goodbye on the TDN Writers Room podcast without saying, hi, Lucy. Yeah, I, I think we need to pixelate that shot a little bit right there. I don't know. That's that, Lucy, come on, be a little more modest. <laughs> now she's out. We love you, Lucy. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll see you next week.